Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles podcast, the bi-weekly show, most of the time, called Things We Said Today. This is a show where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, known for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing, and another uh, Beatles talk show podcast on the solo careers of the Beatles called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two regulars on the show. First of all, a man who's been part of New York radio now for almost 40 years. Between the three regular co-hosts, we've all had careers that are about 40 years. It's pretty amazing. Um, And this guy has been on New York's WFUV for almost 40 years, as I said, uh, giving us a lot of great programming, a lot of great interviews, just recently interviewing the two guys from Tears for Fears, as a matter of fact. He's done a lot of great programming on the Beatles, too. And that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Howdy, everyone. And also we bring on our another regular co-host, a man who for many years worked at the New York Times in their classical department, writing articles for them. And he's also uh, someone who's been writing for Beatle Fan Magazine for many, many years. He's the author of a couple of books on the Beatles. Uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand or Got That Something. I'm sorry. Got That Something. How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and also The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also The Clock is Ticking for next year, October 15th, when his next book comes out that he's written with Adrian Sinclair, a series of books on Paul's solo career, The McCartney Legacy, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. This show is actually more or less kind of like a bonus episode. Um, We have two very special guests that we're bringing on to the program. And (laughs) just for this one time, we're foregoing the Beatle news that we normally have to lead off the show. But we probably will be doing a show next week and we'll catch up on all the latest Beatle news then. But for right now, we welcome Simon Weitzman. And Simon is the producer and director for a brand new film that's about to come out next year on the Beatles called Here, There and Everywhere. And Andy Lee, who is the editor for this film. Gentlemen, welcome to Things We Said Today. Thank you very much for having us. (laughs) This film, Here, There, and Everywhere, is is all about the Beatles and their fandom. And, you know, from what I understand, this is something that the two of you have been working on for four years. And it's a fascinating topic because... (sighs) It's an amazing thing to witness that here we are in 2021 and the Beatles are constantly in the news and the Beatles are everywhere in the media. There's more Beatles radio programs and podcast shows and YouTube channels than ever before. And their fan base continues and thankfully picks up new young fans. And so I want to know from the two of you, we'll start with Simon what gave you the idea to talk about or bring this up in a film? And what specific angles did you want to approach in, in, um, in going, going into this particular topic about their fandom? Simon? Well, thanks, thanks Ken. Um, it's, well, really, I've been, you know, I, I'd been involved with the, you know, the Beatles family, as it were, through the festivals. Uh, for five or six years, and that was doing a series of books, which started off with Eight Arms to Hold You, which was a mm. sort of look at the diary of what happened during Help, which we were very lucky we got Richard Lester to help us out, and we got lots of things from his archive as well. Um, and then that progressed into All You Need Is Love, which was about the Our World satellite broadcast and the creation of All You Need Is Love and how that came to be and how the broadcast sort of sort of waned and waned with the BBC and what they and Moscow TV uh, who then pulled out obviously as we know um, and then it, I did a book with um, with Tom Murray the photographer one of the photographers on the mad day out um, and uh, that was that was a really interesting exercise as well and then after that um, 
worked on a, a project to uh, create a box of images uh, that showed the Beatles in stereograph because they've never been photographed in stereograph in 3D. So that was uh, that was a that was, a, that was a, a, an act of lunacy that took about 15 months to achieve, <laughs> but it was good. It, it, it worked, and during that time. Um, I'd met all these wonderful people, people like yourselves and all the fantastic folk that are listening here. And I just, it just sort of struck me that um, when you walked into a room with all of these people, there was a warmness, uh, there was a togetherness, there was a, there was a level playing field, which you don't get in other sort of areas uh, where there is something famous that you're all attached to. Um, and it was unique and I felt very comfortable. And it was that sort of sense of feeling comfortable and feeling like, you know, I had a place to belong. And I, I you know, I felt the, these were kind of my people, as mm. it were, that sort of spawned the idea. And I, I think it, it sort of occurred to me that it wasn't just the music that everyone was bonding about. It was it was a lifestyle. It was the the effect that these four guys had on so many people, you know. And the way they lived their lives and the way that they took uh, reassurance and security and confidence from uh, the music and, and, and the way that they, they sort of led their lives, you know, and, you know, from being absolutely amazing on stage to the kind of more sort of gar and sort of uh, um, experimental life that they led. I think it sort of opened a lot of people's eyes uh, back then and it gave a lot of people's confidence and it has done throughout the generations and decades since um, so I don't think it's just about the music and that really kind of made me think nobody has really I mean people have written books about fans and, and worked on essays and things about fans but nobody had really given the fans a voice uh, in the Beatles story and that's kind of what I wanted to do very interesting do you want to answer that question <coughs> in your own way there Andy um I, as you were talking, very, very nicely put, Simon, actually. I thought that was... Thanks, nice. so I, was, I read I was it straight off here. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> um, no, I know you didn't. Um, <laughs> that, yes, it is. It, it, I think for everybody who... I, most people find the Beatles when they're young, you know, whether you were young at the time or as a young person. That's my feeling anyway. And I, it's probably the same for all of us. Um, and it's a particularly magical time of life or, or it's a difficult time of life and the Beatles are there to make it magical or something happens, but you, we create this bond with that feeling and then bring it into adult life. And then there's this space when you meet other fans or in, in these uh, festivals where people come together or even just playing, playing their songs with other people um, or reading books and talking about them. You get that feeling as of, of the, the child of wonder and um connectedness and and love i mean that you know as i think paul said once that that you know he was happy that most of the songs were about love you know they weren't you know fuck you as i think he said <laughs> f you he may have said but you know it, it's true and and as a child it just seems obvious i think as a child love is 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 a thing you don't really you have to talk and then you carry it into and so meeting all these people it's um it's a, it's a love fest you know people exploring their creativity the sculptor who does the uh, did the amazing sculptures in um at the waterfront in liverpool andrew edwards you know he's obsessed with them i mean he's brilliant mm. you know but he yeah. makes and he's made you know a huge public world famous sculpture you know and he's taken that from his childhood I like what the two of you have said about it being so much more than the music. And also, you know, it, it's very much my feeling that the music and the art that you experience when you're young, your adolescence, your teenage years, even in your 20s, has the greatest impact on your life. But do you explore at all their popularity through the decades or is it more or less an analysis of fans today? Oh, no. I, I, I'll let Andy answer that, well, please. I was just going to say that what I'm saying is that I think all people find the Beatles when they're young, most people. Right. And so all through the decades, people are finding them when they're young. So it's not the experience for everyone is kind of the same. It's weird. I, I, I'm um, part of, you know, not part of, but there's a group of very, you know, teenage kids who are into the Beatles on Twitter. 
and I've, um, you know, I comment and I'm friends with them and they're friends with me. And it's, they're, they're magnificent. I think they're amazing. They have fun with it. They, they make jokes. Sometimes they're quite irreverent. Other times they just express their adoration. They talk about the music. They, it influences their lives all, all, on all levels, just like kids in the 60s and well, just that's... like me in the 70s. And, you know, so it, it doesn't really matter which decade, but we are across all of the decades of people. But they're, right. they're, it's, it's kind of who they are now is where we are with them. But they talk about stuff, you know, from people like, you know, Rod in the um, Quarry Men. You know, who's he's now with his mates still making music together, but obviously it references back to the time when they were younger when it first all happened. And the, right. uh, that's a really good point because we were fortunate enough uh, to be invited to film uh, the concert they recently did at Strawberry Field. And, um, you know, considering they've not sat, at a, you know, or, or stood and played their instruments for about two years because of the pandemic together at all, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we were able to, you know, they, they put all their things together. And these are people that are, you know, approach, you know, in their late 70s or, or beyond. And um, they, they, were, they were brilliant. But what made it all so brilliant for me, and I think for everyone that was there, uh, you know, they played very well. They were excellent. Uh, but the stories they told were phenomenal. And, you know, sitting there, you know, obviously Andy and myself there with three or four other people very kindly helped us out filming this from every conceivable angle and uh, <laughs> what did, what literally guy, every conceivable what did angle. What say? The guy, one of the camera people. What's his name? Who, who was it? Who was Roger. It? Was it Roger? Roger. Yeah. Roger. Yeah. He's, what did he say? He said we didn't have this many cameras when we filmed Bon Jovi. <laughs> so we, we had a lot of cameras on this thing um, but what was lovely yeah, about it funny. was that they were telling their you know they were telling these wonderful stories about you know their lives um, you know as as a group you know um, when Paul joined what happened you know all these stories I mean they're stories that most of us I Mostly guess taking know. the piss out of each other actually which was, which was the most fun of <laughs> which it was, just which was very lovely silly. but yeah. it was lovely because it was a whole their show and their thing is about sort of bringing those moments to an audience that are multi-generational. So there were people right there who were of the same generation as them, but a lot of people a lot younger. And they could really sort of get a sense of what it was like to be there. In yeah. that moment, you know. mm. And it's also yeah. nice to hear them tell their side of the story instead of always hearing what John said or what Paul said about how yeah. they first met and all. So, yeah. Um, we're going to go around. And each of us are going to ask you questions. We're going <laughs> to we're going to start with Darren. All right. Um, this is such a, a broad topic for a film. It's not like you're doing if you were doing a movie about the band itself. You could say I'm going to do a straight biography, start at the beginning, go to the end, or zero in on a particular the films, or do a you know like a get back thing. But it, the fans that can that can start anywhere. That can go anywhere. Um, what was the starting point and your initial goal for the film? And did the goal change as you <laughs> progressed? That's a brilliant question. Um, yes. <laughs> next um, question. Next question. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, very much so. It, um, I started off, it, this started off as, a, as, a, as an idea that would be a short film. It was going to be, uh, you know, four or five different sort of fairly eclectic sets of people who represented some part of the fan base. Um, so it was designed originally to be a short because um, I'd done things like that before over my life. And I thought, well, this is a six to nine month sort of the job you know, at the end and then of course um, you fall down the rabbit hole with this particular subject um, and this particular group of fans because obviously everyone from the four Beatles is a fan of the Beatles and uh, and the rest of us have followed along you know um, so I think it yeah very much so it changed from being something that I think after literally two or three months of going around filming and being at the festivals and meeting people, um, you get a very different view. And it was, it's, it, it still is changing as we're going along now. I think we do things where a certain thing that we do or a certain set of things we do, they slightly change the, the goalposts on it or slightly change the direction of it. But we've been very deliberate in the way that we've 
you know, I, Andy and I have, uh, we're very good at ha having a similar style of filming, but we're actually quite different in the way that we set things up. I'm, I have a sort of more of a cinema verity style, so I will fall into a situation and try and make the best of a situation. Andy is very good at setting up things and creating a narrative. So between us, that's changed over the last uh, two or three years. We've managed, well, apart from the pandemic point, of trying to kind of do things that kind of, that I feel like they're in a slightly different style in different parts. And of course, on top of all of that, what happened is that after about a year of doing it, people started sending us things. So every week we get sent something, you know, um, and that can be a five minute piece, a performance, or it can be a whole interview that somebody's done and contributed. So we've had sort of, you know, it, it, we're, we're now after a 20 minute sort of short film at the stage where we have, you know, well over 200 hours of archive material, uh, we could go on and make as many movies as anyone will sit and watch. <laughs> but um, but That'd yeah, be lots it, of DVD extras. Yeah, but but from the point of view of did we get, has it changed along the way? Absolutely. And I think the pandemic also changed a lot of things as well. Uh, the situation that people found themselves in, the, the materials that they maybe made during that period, and also now coming out the other end of it, you know, the opportunity to get back and finish off some stories that, you know, weren't we weren't able to do, right. you know. I would imagine so, yeah. with a film like this, though, the pandemic must have really slowed things down significantly, the progress um, of making this film, because you are forced to disconnect with people. Um, uh, yeah, that gave us... Would you, would, you, would you say you would be finished with the film by now, had there not been the pandemic? Or um, I know you're not far from the finish line, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm possibly. Um, it's a difficult it's one because yeah. it's possible that we would have been, yeah, because we would have been able to travel, we would have been able to meet you guys at festivals or events and, and, and do things. And that sort of was fairly stifling. You know, uh, there were also life circumstances that got in the way of being able to do things at certain times during the pandemic for, for a lot of people, including myself. Um, so I think... It's an interesting thing because I think one of the one of the situations we found on the hopefully coming out the other end of this pandemic is that hopefully people's you know enjoyment of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do on the behalf of other fans because this is this is you know Andy and myself are making a film but the film is a is a result of uh, you know a, a, an enormous group effort uh, which the fans have been central to so I hope that what we deliver in the first place next spring, all being well, is is reflective of, of, you know, fans of all generations and ages. And hopefully we'll, because of we, the fact we've been through the pandemic and we can maybe watch this film together, you know, it will, it will sort of maybe sort of not draw a line under things, but it will give us some kind of uh, hope going forward that, you know, maybe we are out this and we are all back together in the same room, watching things and enjoying things and talking about things, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, it might. My, my view of it, um, I said this to you before, I think that, you know, I'm going to say it. This is, this is the magical mystery tour of documentaries about the Beatles. Mm. As in, we haven't got a thesis to put forward. We don't have a story. We've got none of that. What we've got is, and what we're making is, as if you jumped into this world of Beatles fans and just swam around in it and it's like you see this you hear that and it's all woven together and it's a it's a magical experience that's the idea so it's um you know the other thing you talked about when we first talked is it is the white album as in this can be like a like or like an album you know a beatles album things can be very different very close together but the whole thing will have a feeling of being satisfied and a journey that you went on but it was not going to be you know straightforward old-fashioned documentary it's more of a, an immersive experience I would say yeah that's a good phrase I would say that I mean one of the phrases that we sort of sort of mentioned to people along the, the ride which is used in the film world is it's 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 a butterfly trip you know you you Never land for a before. while you you land for a while um oh, you know, right, yeah. in, in you know you fly somewhere else you land for a while you observe you go somewhere else but it's all connected as andy said this is a sort of immersive experience really so and that's sometimes part of the when, fun of doing it you know sometimes when i'm editing i get um i come to a piece 
somebody mentions a particular character like Helen mentions Cynthia. Helen this is Anderson Helen Anderson. Was, at, yeah. was at school with John and she was friends with Cynthia. And I've got someone, I've got Julia mentioning Cynthia or something. And I'm thinking I can connect these two together. And then at the end of Julia, I, I, and I'm sort of attaching these things together, not always by a word, sometimes by a song, sometimes by a feeling. And, uh, you know, sometimes you cut yourself into cul-de-sacs where you just come back to the beginning. I've got to put her in her hair now. But as you move it all around, it just becomes, well, you know, my, our aim is to make it a very easy, fun and interesting journey through all somebody, of these uh, stories. Somebody said to us while we were doing this, this crowdfunding that we've been doing, that it's kind of like sort of creating the ultimate festival you know, Beatles Festival on film. <laughs> uh, oh. And I thought that was a pretty good expression because yeah. I think hopefully people will feel like they are at a festival and they're learning about all these different facets of what it is to be a Beatles fan and hopefully um, seeing themselves in it. And that's, you know, hopefully we'll all see ourselves in it. Can I just add something about what you were saying about the pandemic? Um, I would think that, and we've all witnessed this, because of the horror of the pandemic, it's forced people to be more creative to the extent that we've had so many virtual events online. And so because you have, you know, a Zoom or a StreamYard or whatever, you can now interview people like we are with you. <laughs> You're yeah. talking from England right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that must make things, you know, even better to do a documentary like this instead of having to be with them in person. <laughs> oh, that's disagree. a good question. Um, <laughs> it's it's it, there. There is. I, I understand what you're saying, Ken, on that because you can obviously reach out to a lot more people. I think it's always lovely to be able to be in the space with somebody, you know, sure. and be able to kind of understand their world and see their world and immerse yourself in it. And, and also um, it's, to be able to interesting yeah. to be able to physically choose where you go in their world, even in their room just to, when filming to produce, a, you know, because in the end of film is just a lot of face on interviews with, you know, cutaways of bits of musical performance. For me that it can be good. I mean, I'm not, you know, actually I, I have a, I, I pref it's great when you can feel like you're in somebody's space when you watch a film and you, you get a sense of their environment and stuff going on. It, it's just more like a movie. Whereas the other thing, in fact, is, is like a podcast. I think, you know, a lot mm. of things, a lot of documentaries or I wouldn't say a lot. There are some documentaries you watch them and you think, well, you know, this would, it's, it's a good documentary, but I, I don't need the pictures. <laughs> Not giving me anything more other than what the person's face looks like. I think, I think the, the question about that Darren was mentioning about the pandemic though, is it has made more people more creative. I think you're absolutely right. And there's certainly a lot of music and people kind of trying to cheer everyone else up uh, during it. And one of the things that Andy did do uh, as a as part of the edit and exercise, it uh, made a, a version of Let It Be uh, that was made up purely of different performances of Let It Be that were made during the pandemic period, which I thought was wasn't, really no, it wasn't, it wasn't, well, it wasn't just, just all. The, it yeah. was just lots, okay. lots of them on YouTube. I, I, I actually need to contact all those people to ask their permission. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was an exercise at that point, but the idea of, of actually people coming on during great, during the pandemic, you know, there was this, I think there was a great big surge after the initial lockdown for everyone of people sort of going, right, okay, I'm going to make music, I'm going to cheer myself up and everyone else up or tell stories or, you know, and we saw that in the virtual fest, the virtual fests were all really important, I thought, you know, they, they, it was very difficult for people because they couldn't all be in the same room. We couldn't do all the things that we were doing. But the fact that people went to the trouble of putting them on um, and getting us all in the same windows as we are now um, so that we could be up. You know, I was sitting there in the middle of the night on some of these things and it's you still felt there was a connection. So I thought I think people were very creative and maybe, you know, maybe we'll see on the other side of the pandemic now more creation. Meta. In meta, when we're all course. inside in metaverse, meta. <laughs> yes, that's where we're going, mate. That's, that's where it. we're going. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, all right. Uh, oh, go ahead, Darren. Alan. Now I was going to say I have another question, but let Alan. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, jump in. No, you sure? Um, you know, fan, fan is short for fanatic, and I would imagine <laughs> that in a project like this, you must have stumbled upon maybe. Uh, the dark side of of uh, of the fan, um, and 
assuming you did stumble upon things that weren't rosy and very positive, how did you address that? Do we make a complete picture of the Beatle fan or were you hesitant to maybe include something that might have gotten a little dark, whatever that may mean? There's a, there's, a, there's a very good example, actually, Darren, on that, which is that um, I, I don't know if you, because we've met at the fests, you know, I, I was... Over the years, I've been showing, you know, because there's so much, <laughs> uh, you know, a few hours or something at midnight after the main sort of uh, yeah, right. concerts, you know. And that's been really interesting because, you know, several people or one particular person came out after that. And he said to me, um, uh, I, you know, I, are you still doing the stories about this? Because I'd like to tell my story. And it was basically the fact that, you know, um, if it not been for the lyrics of John, particularly of John Lennon, that he would have killed himself. And, you know, this this does can take you down a very dark alley, but the positive side of that is that, you know, somebody who had, uh, you know, who had sort of autism, uh, didn't feel they had a place in the world, found it very difficult to connect. Um, the solace, the thing that pulled them back from the abyss, the edge was, you know, A, listening to the Beatles, but particularly John's lyrics. And, you know, whenever he sort of felt really desperate, he would sort of read anything he could about John, you know, and that's, I think that's really pretty powerful stuff. So yeah, it's, it does look on that side. We do touch on that sort of side of things, of course, you know. Um, what, what do you mean by, by the dark side, Dan? Cause I, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't call that dark side. I'd call that somebody no. getting something amazing from the Beatles. What I mean, do you I mean don't exactly? know, maybe, maybe, um, you know, something that, uh, that got very, maybe, uh, um eerie or or or, or <laughs> disturbing whatever that might be however you want to define that that you maybe felt that we should include this to be inclusive or leave this off to keep uh to keep a certain mood of the film uh alive i don't think we've had anything like that have we i, I it's it's no i mean, i think as i said uh darren i think you know we've had people that have come up that have had uh, situations where they've kind of been on the brink, you know, really been on the brink of whether they whether they keep living or not. Um, and we have tried to include parts of those stories in what we're doing. Yeah, and, you think, know, there yeah. are there are there are sort of areas of of, of people's lives, you know, that that, that that are very dark. And I think one of the things that's very positive about the film are is you, that are you talking about obsessive people trying to get to be in the film or something like 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 sort of you know people who are over the top obsessed kind of i hope this never yeah. happens <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, again the definition's vague i mean it, mm. someone like that yeah who you know maybe turn, made themselves into um uh you know um uh a pest for lack of a better word yeah to mm. get you know in your specifically in your film no, no. not particularly no we've not Everyone's really had been really really lovely <laughs> Yeah, we've been very. I, I guess we've been quite lucky in that side. But as I said, you know, we have, we've, we've had sort of, we've had people that sort of have had huge kind of sort of crises in their life, and this has brought them back. So I don't think we've kind of really reached anyone, or nobody's kind of been, you know, we've not been sort of inverted commas stalked by anyone in terms of of the thing of is that anyone wants which to we're be making this film. film. Yeah. Anyone wants to be in this film, all they got to do is ask. I mean, obviously, not everyone's going to end up in it at the end, but we're not. Maybe people who are more difficult to get to end up with stalkers or people desperate to try and do it. But we're, you know, we're just so we're such an open book. It's no challenge for somebody who wants to have a, you know, it's not like trying to get to Paul McCartney or something. <laughs> they go, they're off. They're off trying to get to those people. They're not trying to get to us or cause us any trouble. <laughs> right. Alan? Okay. Um, speaking of getting to you, um, I think we should point out, um, which maybe we should have done at the start, is that you have an Indiegogo page to raise money yes. for the production. And on the Indiegogo page, um, uh, which I guess people could probably find by Googling Indiegogo and here, there, and everywhere, and Beatles, that should should find it, unless you have the it address will. handy that you read. Yes, we can. Um, it's we pretty can. handy. It's yeah. pretty easy. We, I've made a tiny URL, and it, so it's tinyurl.com slash h-t-a-e film h-t-a-e is the initials of here there and everywhere so right tinyurl.com slash h-t-a-e film 
Okay. Anyone that doesn't understand slash, it's forward slash. Yeah. The other thing you can do is just go to beetlesdoc.com, which is our website, which is easier. Mm. Beatles You'll DOC. find it through that. There and on this Indiegogo page, there is a short clip people can watch um, that that I think gives an idea of some of the stuff you have um, and, and things that you've mentioned, um, maybe one of which I think you haven't clarified. You talked about Helen Anderson, who uh, was a, a friend of Cynthia's and art school pal of John's. I think was she his girlfriend for a while? No, not according no. to her. Okay. Um, <laughs> but then when you mentioned Julia, you didn't identify uh, Baird as you know, Sorry. Julia Baird, John's si half-sister. Um, so she's in there. So you've got uh, Helen Anderson, Julia Baird, the guys from the Quarrymen. Um, you know, it's not just people like us. <laughs> it's people who <laughs> have oh. some actual connections um, in some cases. Um <clears throat> So I, I just thought, thought I'd you know, point those things out so people can go to your site and have a look at a bit of the film. Um, one you. of the things that struck me as interesting, um, and you did touch on, uh, I think, in when talking to Ken, um, were the performances and the art. And, you know, it's not just people, it, it's not just going to be a couple of hours of people obsessing about the Beatles. <laughs> you know, you've got um, a number of <laughs> bands playing Beatles things. You've got artists doing sculpture and um, some quite nice drawings, portraits of the mm -hmm. Beatles. Um, is that something that, um, you know, you ran into it at one of the fests or conventions and thought, OK, this might be a, an interesting sideline. Or did you particularly go out of your way to find, uh, you know, how the Beatles art inspired other art, including art about the Beatles, basically? I, I, it's, it's, it's a good question, Alan. Um, the, the reality is it's a bit of all of it. So there were, you, I'm, I'm pretty good at making connections at different places, you know, so you run into something and you, you're there to do a specific thing, but you meet somebody else who has another story to tell or they're part of that story. And then, as I said, it is this rabbit hole that you go down each time. So, and, you know, it's, it is about finding things and thinking of areas that, you know, uh, and how diverse this whole group of fan, this fan family is. So, you know, if you meet an artist, you will almost certainly meet another artist. Uh, or, you know, if you're with a band, then there'll be some other element to it that they will be able to point you with. Um, and it's the same with, you know, some of the, the better known people that are in the film or the people that are closer to the original sort of four. Um, you know, there'll always be something where they said, have you, you know, it's always the thing at the end of an interview, have you spoken to such and such? Or do you know such and such? And, um, you know, in, in most cases, uh, you follow up and, uh, and and it's, I think that's what's so good about the film is that the different people you, you meet so take yourself. you, if you it is, is, is that it takes you in all these different directions. You know, it does take you, that's why we were saying about the butterfly thing, is that you, you, you can't, you do meet all these different people people along the way they have a different story to tell they're in a different area or psyche of the Beatles sort of phenomena um, and and their expression of it comes through all these different ways whether that be artistic whether that be spoken word written word um, or just recollection memory collectors you know the whole sort of memorabilia thing is is interesting you know people that have collected as you, as as Darren said fairly you know on the on the fanatical side you know the the, the collectors uh, probably kind of tick a certain element of that box but it is most collectors that collect sort of have um, there's always you know there's the story that they tell about the thing that they own but the, the thing they own has a connection to a period in their own life a lot of the time so it, there are all these little connections and I think one of the the things that you know as Andy was saying about sort of picking things out and connecting them and weaving them together is that that's the process it's the process of making the film is to find different people and find what connects them together because we're all connected in one way or another um, but it's that challenge of then finding a direction through the film that does that so I think yeah and we the festivals are extremely useful because there are always people there you've never met you know or never had a chance to talk to Mm -hmm. And and a lot of them have got hidden these hidden skills and 
uh, things, you know, and uh, we've had people that come to us and said, you know, they work at such and such and that's their day job and they love the Beatles. And then you find out that they do all these amazing things or have these amazing skills. And part of what we're trying to do is sort of encourage those things out so they can share them with other people. And that's, that's just, again, part of the process. It's not, this is why we're saying it's not just about the music. It is about us. It's, it's an, it's sort of a, an adventure or a journey of finding, you know, what, what drives us to be us and why, why these four people bring out these other parts of us in our, in our own characters. Mm -hmm. um, did you find uh, notable differences between um, Beatles fans from different countries, from the US and the UK, for instance, but, but then also when you get farther afield to places where English isn't the first language, mm -hmm. Um, what, what have you found in, in terms of the, the variety of fans around the world? I think that they're all that, that I think that the thing that's remarkable is that there's no real difference. Everybody's the same. There's differences in, you know, Americans will, you know, maybe in general express themselves with a little less reserve perhaps than, than Brits, <laughs> but these are just the normal <laughs> cultural differences that you would see with people. Mm -hmm. But the, What's just so wonderful about it is that you can meet people from anywhere in the world. And if you're both Beatles fans, it's like the rest of it doesn't matter. Come on. I mean, a lot of us would say, you know, if I had to give up everything from my culture and, and my, everything that I love and leave just one creative, you know, thing, I'd, most of us would pick the Beatles, I think. Would you? I mean, I would. It's enough of it, you know, the whole lot, right? There's enough in there to keep me going. Fine. Mm. And I think it's the same with all of us. And so the rest of it, it just doesn't matter anymore. It's like, oh, right. Yes. Oh, right. You know this about Yellow Submarine or whatever it is, or, or oh, John said this. No, he didn't. Oh, all those, those quotes that get posted and they're all wrong. And he never said it. And people have all these kind of things with each other. And <laughs> it's just great. And so I, I just haven't noticed a difference I, the thing that you notice is is when we're all speaking the same language we, we're the same people you know we're the same family i think that's and the, the great that thing language is, is beatles and and that's where the songs come in isn't it that's if you're in a room with a group of people and they don't speak the same language they can all they're all singing the songs <laughs> and, mm. they, and they all know what the songs mean even if they don't speak the language that well you know so i think that again is a huge connectivity i, I don't know another band that's really managed to do it on that scale i don't there isn't one you're not on that scale, no. no. <clears throat> yeah, you can go to uh, the Beatle Festival in England and you'll have people from all over the world, different Beatle bands, and they're pronouncing everything phonetically, you know, mm. not in their language. And they may not know exactly what they're saying, but, <laughs> yes. you know, they take the yeah. time to study, oh. you know, how the words sound. And that alone mm. is, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, that's right. the great, that it. is the, that's the great thing about the festivals that I, you know, I do miss and, you know, the actual physical being in a festival, which is that, you know, one of the great things that we, we've said a number of times is that it doesn't matter what politics you have. It doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, any of it, you know, or your pay scale, any of it. When you're in those rooms and when you're with other people and you're all singing the song, you know, we're all, that's the real, that's the real us. And that's, that's mm -hmm. you. Okay. everybody's all united when that happens yeah. so yeah yeah how about differences between generations of fans i mean i've i've run into you know on one hand really young people who know a lot about this and really love it and are you know just very open to talking about it and and everything and i've, I've also run into this slightly strange to me situation where where younger fans are saying you know we're sick of you first gen guys you know hogging all the air time we want to talk about what we think of the Beatles you know um have you run into that any tension between generations no 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 no, no. not really I think it's I mean as, as Andy said earlier on, you know, you got the, the Twitter and the TikTok generation that are coming through and doing their own thing with it. But they very much kind of, they're going their own way, but they're very much in the same style. I'm sure that we would have done it when we were at their age, you know. So I don't think so. I think, um, 
uh, one of the things that you kind of do get occasionally is you get sort of, uh, as you would do if any sort of band or anything, you get purists who have, you know, it's like, it has to be the Beatles. They have to be the ones doing the, you know, it's fine listening to the cover bands, you know, but it's not the Beatles, it's not them. And I think, you know, um, one of the things that's great about the festivals and, and all of these events is that, you know, people, wh whether they do them faithfully or whether they put their own spin on them, they, you know, everyone who plays these songs loves loves the songs, loves the Beatles, even if they're doing something different with it. And I think that's that's a beautiful thing. You know, we it doesn't matter what generation you're from, you can you can do it, you know, if, if jazz is your thing and you want to do it in a jazz way, or if you if you're uh you know even you know I've you know I've heard people doing sort of you know dark metal versions of Beatles songs, you know. But you know, they love it. They're all fans, you know, um and it's just their interpretation of a thing, you know. And I suppose the the only thing you find is that there's a bit of a resistance where people say, Oh, it's just they're just a cover band of you know, the real thing. And, you know, and they're forgetting which, that, of which course, is what the Beatles were. Yeah. That's where they started <laughs> as a cover band, you know, right. and then sort of built their talent. And, and now you look at sort of, there's young, you know, two young female bands. So there's, there's uh, Mona Lisa twins. There's Dame Trona. You know, they've, 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 they've started their careers by covering the Beatles and other wonderful bands from different, you know, from those kind of eras. Uh, and they've built upon those skills and learning those skills to create their own music and their own albums. And that's, that is what we're seeing. You know, we're seeing people like Chris McCarty, who is, you know, a wonderful artist who is brilliant at doing covers, but he also does brilliant music of his own. And, and we see that over and over and over again through the decades and generations of, of, of young people who are embracing it, taking it, learning it, covering it, doing it their way, and then using that skills and those repetitive skills and those the learnings that they've taken from these guys who were able to write such brilliant music and uh, uh, that stick in our heads and, and take a, a nugget of those parts and uh, and turn it into their own thing. And I think that's that's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, say what you want about cover bands, the likelihood of running into the original is very <laughs> slim. <laughs> exactly. <Fair enough>. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I was thinking is that you had this band that were around predominantly for about eight years that changed their look and, and their style so much in a very condensed space of time. And then beyond that, you have David Bowie, who, you know, was a comedian, remodeled himself, remodeled the music, and then you have Madonna. And, then you, and I think, you know, one of the things that they don't really get as much credit for as they, they should do is that they... They showed it it was okay to change. They showed it was okay to experiment. They showed it was okay to do these things. And that if people loved them and people believed in them, they would still love them and believe in them. And I think that's a really important thing that younger people have taken from that is the ability to reinvent themselves along the way. And, you know, I think the Beatles were probably roughly the first people to do that, you know, in, a, in our lifetimes anyway, mm. you know. I sometimes wonder the the excitement level is it exactly the same for young fans as the old fans because just by the way that we were brought up if the Beatles were on television if they were on the Ed Sullivan show that was an event you had to be there at that moment you had to have the TV on at that time and that's it now like you said you can go on YouTube and watch whatever you want from the Beatles hear any song you want from the Beatles everything is at your disposal you know <laughs> In the 60s hmm. and even growing up in the 70s, it was so much different. A new video was an event for a song, you know. <laughs> right. They're going to get it. That they're, they're all very, very excited, as everyone is, about Get Back. Oh, yeah. About, mm. about the, the TV. So for them, that's the event. I mean, I know they won't necessarily, mm. all, but they probably will all watch it at the same time because they'll literally press go the minute it's available <laughs> mm -hmm. all at the we'll same see. time. But, um, you know. It, if so it's available I think it, it, on demand, if it's available on demand for a month or much longer, they might just say, "Ah, oh, wait a week." No, you know? no, they are they are beside themselves with excitement. They are okay. absolutely. I hope so. <laughs> no, they really are. I mean, okay, it's maybe a small selection, but they are proper teenage Beatles fans, and they are, you know, absolutely, yeah. I'm, I think I think one of the things that's really interesting, the word without saying something a bit rude. <laughs> one of the things is one of the things that's really interesting is that they are, um, you know, because Peter Jackson has kind of been given this sort of Aladdin's cave to work with, you know, is that this is I suppose this is the closest you'll feel to being in the same room with them, 
as as yeah. you will ever do you as know? any of us uh, ever have as well yeah, exactly. and they're getting that these yeah. young people are getting that mm. experience yeah. and I, I i can't imagine how excited i would have been to have been able to see this film when i was the kid just mm. even more excited than i am now have you gone to um you know, not necess- not obviously for this project, but just in in your lives, have you gone to other sort of fan worlds? You know, Trekkies and uh, Comic Con, or any any of the you know other enthusiasms that have conventions and meetings. Have you have you looked into those worlds as well, no. Andy? No, no, no. I mean, all, all I thought back was I I remember when I was a kid, I used to go to model train things occasionally, <laughs> but apart from that. And I, and I remember that was great, but uh, no, I've not, I never really, until I met Simon, I, w- I didn't really consider myself a fan. <laughs> this is my, I just thought fan, being a fan was something that other people did and it just wasn't, I just felt like it was. And so I never got involved in the Beatle fan world other than mm. once with a friend being taken to the Beatle Fest in New Jersey, which I enjoyed, but I just felt sort of, I don't know. I don't know. It just was a thing. I didn't, you know, if somebody said, you, oh, well, we know you're a Beatles fan. I just felt, oh, what are you saying? It just <laughs> felt weird. <laughs> um, and then Simon, you know, I met Simon and we started working on this project and we went up to the um, Fest for Beatles fans a couple of years, uh, well, before the, the pandemic, International the one before Beatles the, Fest. Yeah. In, sorry, yeah. wrong one. International, International Beatles, Beatles, Beatles Fest. Week. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. Get there. Um, <laughs> yeah, to film. And yeah. um <clears throat> once we got in there and I met all these people and, and there was, and it was everything he'd said, you know, about it being this, like this family, it was like, of course, what was I doing all those years? Just being <laughs> a little bit snooty about fans as if they were, you know, maybe I, I took the word fanatic a bit to heart and thought, no, I'm not like that. I am actually, that's the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, they're great people. I really enjoy their company. There's always some, and they're, they're very generous, warm people. I think that there's a generosity in the music. I, I, it's, it's a weird thing to say, but there's something about the the way the music comes across. It's 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 generous to your ears. It maybe it's, a lot of it's to do with George Martin. It's very playful in the sounds and the kind of the, the world it creates for you, and it attracts people who really really get into it, who have a similar view of life, and they just want to support and be friendly and helpful and have fun with each other it it, it is uh yeah so i i was converted and now i i (laughs) really i I think going back going going back to the question the only other world that i've sort of seen anything of would be would be through the comic-con sort of side of things you know a friend of mine is is a very well-known author who's written some very famous things (laughs) in the science fiction world so kind of going into those kind of worlds and seeing the way the adulation and things but there is I think you know it's lovely and it's beautiful and people dress up and you know they meet their heroes a lot of the time all these kind of things and that's that's kind of an important thing um this is the first it's not quite and only, the same, it's, 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 it's no this is the only world that I've been in where you arrive at a place and and it's kind of like it's like it, it, we all remember cheers you know mm-hmm. you know it's like everyone's norm when they walk into a room at the festival <laughs> norm you know um you know and that's and it's a great feeling you know that's why it sort of I feel that you know these kind of events and places and knowing people like yourselves and being able to hang out it's very empowering and in a way that I don't think there is this kind of relationship between people anywhere else. And that's, I think, hopefully what we express in the film. One of the great things about the crowdfund is that, you know, this is a film that's made by fans, uh, with fans, for fans, uh, which has been supported and funded by fans who have, in many cases, um, claimed rewards that have been put forward by fans. By fans, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we know. haven't had to do anything at all. It's been it's so just, easy. It's just, just fact, absolutely you beautiful talking, thing, you know. You were asking earlier about the pandemic and, and how it's affected the project. I mean, one of the main things it did is it got us focused on yeah. doing a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and we, were re- we thought we were ready to launch this campaign a, a, almost a year before we actually did. Um, and then suddenly we realized that you know, we're not ready to do this. We, we haven't, you know, we, 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 we hadn't, we didn't really know. I mean, you've done some crowdfunding campaigns before for books, yeah. but we've never yeah. done, never done anything quite like this and we wanted it to work. And so 
we worked as well as all the other stuff going on in life and, uh, um, to, to bring it together. And Simon called on all the fans he's met over the years um, who he stays friends with everybody. I don't know how he does it at all. It's brilliant. <laughs> and uh, they all just piled in with, oh, here's a bit of the Cavern Club stage. You, know, you put that in your thing. And here's a maquette of the, of, the, of the Beatles that I made before I made the waterfront sculptures, Andy said. Do you have that? You do that. And, uh, and records from, you know, the, the, well, we had the unopened Gary, record. Gary, Gary, Gary well, Mal Evans. Evans. Yeah. Son, yeah. you know, had... had um, uh, Mal, Mal Evans' son, uh, uh, Mal, Mal, who everyone knows who Mal is. Do I have to explain? Or, no, uh, no. Beatles? I don't. Okay, good. I know you would. I just thought people listening were there. Anyway, so his son, um, he, Mal was given five copies of the 67 Christmas single by Paul um, because Mal's in them, goofing around with them. And um, then Gary gave one of them to us and said, oh, we put this on your thing, you know, unopened and unstamped so I, I don't i there are collectors who collect unopened records aren't there right you know anytime you there you are too oh, unless you were the one who bought <laughs> it you're too late um because <laughs> it's gone unfortunately but oh uh, it, so it's in the original mailer and the no, mailers are normally stamped and franked you know with, 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 the, with right. an address and a, and a thing torn open obviously by some crazed fan excited to open it this one is nothing and it comes with the story and he he gave it to us and it's been like that. And people have given us all sorts of things. We, I had it in my house. Still, I've got a collection of things. I, I could do one, make one of those um, beetle man caves that people do. Beetle room. <laughs> I could do one now because I've got all this stuff here. But I'm for, well, fortunately, it's all going to go out to the fans who contributed. And right. just, yeah, this, I wanted this to, say my... to, to clarify that these are these are things for, for contributors. And, and the mail, yes. the mail disc is gone. It's gone, unfortunately. Yeah, it's oh, gone. one has it's gone, gone, I'm afraid. But, uh, yeah, but I mean, this has been the wonderful thing about it is, is this sort of beautiful relationship where, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it is a collective, this film is, is a proper collective of a group of fans that have got together to put something out that other fans can enjoy. That's mm -hmm. it. It's really simple. Yep. So yes. um, my last question is, um, when do you think it will be done and out for people to see in its entirety? Well, uh, we uh, will be ready for uh, spring 2022. So we are, our aim, uh, all being well, if it goes ahead, is to be able to show a public performance of it um, at the fest in New Jersey, New York, mm. um, in, in the first few days of April. That's the, yes. the aim. Um, and then obviously everything that follows on. But because, you know, that festival has been really important to us in, in the creation of this film and meeting so many wonderful people like yourselves, um, you know, we that's what I want to do. We, we want to be able to kind of show it to that audience publicly first. You know, we have, really. We've we've told, we, we've had a conversation with Mark in which he's expecting it to be shown. So one way or another, we're going to be, <laughs> it will be shown. Something. It will it, definitely you know, be shown. Depending yeah. on how many extra shoots, because we keep coming, you know, we, we, we went over our target and we're still collecting and all the money that we're, we're getting is going to be spent on more shoots with more interesting people. So, you know, even if we're still filming at that point, we will have a film of a decent length to show people at the fest. This, this <laughs> is this is always this has always been the amusing kind of sort of thing that's made me smile is that when we started the this operation, it's taken the best part of a year to launch the crowdfund. We, we've been sitting with a hundred minutes on a timeline that would make a really perfectly good movie, more or less as it sits. Oh. <laughs> and you know, and it, there was this temptation of going out to say, you know, sort of, we, what do we do to to convince this audience? Do we show them a hundred minutes so that we have enough money to finish the trailer? You know, um, <laughs> it's always been. <laughs> We, so the crowdfunding campaign has been my mo it's been an incredible experience uh, uh, linking with all with these fans linking through facebook um uh subscribers and and everyone who helped and mark from the fest who's helped us to connect with people and um and john and people from the cavern club and yeah rogue and you know from the caspar club everyone's been really i mean incredibly generous with their time one thing actually alan i was going to come back you've been very kind to kind of give us some air time on the on the funding side of it uh and one of the things that um has been like quite moving for me is that you know one of the things my dad died at the beginning of the pandemic and i never got a chance to show him the film you know and um, so I, I wanted his name remembered at the end of the film on the credits. And I, so we decided to open this out to anyone that kind of joined us on the 
you know, on this journey through the funding uh, on on that site, that if they, you know, had somebody they wanted remembered, it didn't matter if it's from the last few years, uh, you know, it's somebody that's dear to them, that we would put their name in an in memory of sequence at the end, you know, because so many people we've lost over the years that are all big fans, you know, and we wanted them, it's their film too. So we sure. wanted to kind of do something that kind of reflected that as well. And that's, that's had a really amazing and overwhelming, quite emotional response for me, because it's been a lot of people have told me the story about how they've lost people uh, over the years. And, and, you know, it means something for us to be able to include them as well. And that's, it's a huge part. We're all in this together. Mm-hmm. Sure. So is it possible that the final cut, uh, whatever is shown at the Fest for Beatle fans may not be the final cut? <laughs> it may not be. It, it, it may not be. It's, I mean, it's because possibility. Of, That'll yeah. have to be we, a we, bonus I mean, there's, edit on the Blu-ray. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's going to be there's going to be lots. You know, that there, there's you know, say so we have been uh, working on the crowdfunder for you know for a long time to get it right, and kept thinking we were about to launch it, and then holding back and doing a bit more and getting some more names, and you know, then only doing it because it, we did it as an all or nothing. If we didn't get the amount of money we'd asked for as the initial goal, then we weren't going to get a penny, and we knew we had one shot, and uh, luckily. Well, from I think the hard work and just just the incredible generosity of of all the people, as we've talked about, we've managed to make the goal and, and we're starting to creep over it. And so as we creep over more, we start working, thinking of trips we can make and people we can see who we want to include. And there will be a DVD Blu-ray at some point. Yes, there you is. Can already yes. pre-order it. You can already pre-order it on the oh. uh, on the crowdfunder site. So okay. that is that is right there. And if you do that, you also get your as I said you get your name in the end credits as well. So you're immortalized on the end credits lost during their life or in the last few years or whatever, then we can honor them as well. You know, it's it's a really it is it's our film. It's all of our film. Yeah. And we just put a great track under the end credits. Yeah. What is they're going to most- be long, a couple of tracks. <laughs> what is the most far flung place that you went to uh, uh, to, uh, to interview a fan or to just check out maybe a scene and to see who you might uh, meet there? Well, it's, it's again, it's a very good question because we've had, you know, the obvious places that we've been through across the States and across some of Europe and, and UK. So, but further afield, obviously, in the last few years, it's been more difficult. But there's there's some wonderful people that we'd love to kind of, uh, you know, we've done some work with in the Philippines, uh, you know, incredible band out there. Um, and a group lost of brothers. their family in the tsunami. Yeah, and, I mean, so they're called the Rio Brothers and they are, you know, they're in the Philippines. They lost their family in a tsunami in 2015. Um, you know, and they were displaced, uh, lived in another country, um, lived in a basement for a certain amount of time. They're probably one of the, if you shut your eyes and listen to them, they are probably one of the best cover bands we've ever heard. They're incredible. Um, but their personal story is ridiculous. It's, it's, you know, how they survived all of it, you know. So we're hoping, yeah, it's one of our goals now is to kind of get that story properly wrapped up. Um, and so, yeah, it's, and, and, you know, yeah. we've, you know, and there's there's other people that we've met, you know, further afield again, you know. Um, there's there's people that have been involved with the art side of it that are in Malaysia. I used to work in Malaysia. So there's people in Malaysia, young people in Malaysia have put artwork forward for us to use in the film. So it's from everywhere. We were saying, weren't we, Andy, before you'd counted up that amongst the people that have uh, contributed you know, 17, 17 different Seven. countries, there's people from 17 different countries already that have kind of contributed so far to it. So mm-hmm. it just shows how extensive this, this global world. That's definitely one of the things is. when we, you know, when we were planning the crowdfunder, which was, you know, when we were talking about it before the, um, even before the pandemic, we were talking about, we've got to do this. Um, what One of the things we wanted to do was to use the money to travel to some farther far flung places to actually meet people in person, because we do have interviews that we've done over Zoom, but with a camera in the room, you know, so we, uh, with people in different parts of the world, in, in South America, in um, India. Um, and have we got anyone in Africa yet? Anywhere in Africa? We must have someone think... somewhere in Africa. We have South Africa, maybe. Yeah. We should do a yeah. bit more investigating. 
now that we've got the finances to maybe make a trip or two or uh, you know the ability hopefully as things get yes, better the ability, to, to, the yeah, ability. To, that's been the real major factor for us is not having the ability to to physically go and see it was, comes back to what you're saying earlier ken you know being in the room with people being at the festival with people it, it, you know ultimately that will it's going to be sweet when we're all back in that room and feel confident hopefully you know <laughs> that's for sure so long yeah. overdue now oh gosh yeah mm-hmm. yeah but, uh, but it's great people like yourselves you know you look at what you're doing on this show you oh. know the guy you guys getting i mean the, what you di- guys do is incredibly sort of this, this is a massive part of the whole journey isn't it it's it's the is cathartic exercise i'm sure for you guys and it certainly is for us to you know and and you know I've, I, I was sitting here listening to one of your podcasts earlier ken you know and you know and it's a it's a way of filling the room with something that is hopeful and interesting and you know so i think it's it's you know it's we all have this fantastic part we play and it's all mainly as we know for the love of doing it you know we're, we're, we're not here to get incredibly rich it's just to hmm. it's just to tell stories or hear stories and share stories and and that's a part that's a huge part of what this is all about you know yeah, yeah. I was gonna, it's, with the it's um, just connecting connecting with the fans yeah with, with the with the 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 fate the, the more famous fans who are in it the people who knew them at the time the quarry men and julia baird and uh, helen and all those characters the thing that allows them to be in this film is that they are fans and that they are you find them if it's if it were a wildlife film you find (laughs) them amongst the fans that's where you find these people (laughs) you know they're they're in the same field um and so so that's uh, that's what i like about them there's there's a lovely bit where where um julia baird is uh talking about meeting chris mccarty in some bar in the united states were they on some sort of tour doing Mm. something in the united states and sitting in a bar and there was this guy playing Beatles music on the stage somewhere and she got talking to him and when and then uh, it said well if you ever come over to England look me up and I you know I can I can get you a slot on the Cavern Club stage (laughs) (laughs) and uh you know not expecting him to ever pop his head and one day he turned up (laughs) and she got him the slot on the stage and they're, they're great friends and you know so that connection between someone so close to the Beatles John Lennon's sister, yeah, bringing a guy all the way from the over from the states to to live his dream and uh, celebrating it. Everyone celebrating each other. Mm-hmm. It's such a marvelous thing, you know, being a part of uh, Beatle conventions through all the years and seeing a lot of Beatles cover bands and many of them do their own arrangements and some of them are close to the Beatles arrangements and they all develop an audience of their own. And they're all different ages. And sometimes there's nothing quite like seeing some little kid up there on stage mm. who's just learned the Beatles. You know, it just does your heart good to know that that music is still finding its way to new generations over and over and over again. It's mm. something that's quite miraculous to think that this catalog that's 50 to 60 years old, <laughs> you know, that young people are discovering it. But it's, it's been that way through all the different decades. And, uh, you know, it's great to share that with people throughout all the shows that that we've done and and the podcast world and the YouTube world. And, um, you know, it's growing in leaps and bounds. And I wish I had the time to listen to every good show that's out there because there's so many of them. But um, this has been great uh, spending time with us, Simon and Andy. And once again, why don't we give the folks the URL again? Yeah. Are you still accepting donations for the? Oh yeah, we, we we're now in a we because we went over the target. Thanks yeah. to all, all the fans, uh, we're in a, a section of Indiegogo now that's called In Demand. So we're allowed to keep going um, and raising funds towards it. So the URL is www.tinyurl as it sounds dot com forward slash h t a e film or if that's too much to remember, our website is Beatlesdoc. That's B E A T L E S D O C dot com. And we couldn't believe it when we were looking for a website name and we found that was available <laughs> last year. It was like, what? Nobody's taken Beatlesdoc.com. So we, we took it and now it's easy to remember. Okay. Well, we look forward to seeing this at the fest and seeing. Will you be there too, Andy? Well, my daughter will be giving birth. Mm. So I'm going to be a grandfather, would you believe? Oh, wow. Um, mm. On at the end of uh, March. So depending on the timing, I'd hope to be there. But, 
you know, I'm, let's see. I, okay. nobody, nobody, nobody wants to have children with me or so I don't have any, <laughs> so I will be there. <laughs> well, this has been great sharing this time guys. Yeah. And, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you all for giving us time with you. Thanks. Best thank of you. luck with this film. And we look forward to seeing you, Simon, and hopefully you, Andy, <laughs> uh, when the fest happens. Thank and you. I sure hope it happens. Um, yeah. And in, it's April, right? The April first, uh, yeah. the first, first yeah. second yeah. and third or yeah. something, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you. Thank to you. To everybody watching. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for everyone. Thanks to everyone for listening to us and thanks for all your time. Thank you guys for having us. Alright. Our pleasure. And we'll see you next time. Bye.